1 Samuel 21. David arose and left, and Jonathan came back to the city. David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the Cohen. Ahimelech hurried to greet David and said to him, Why are you alone, with no one accompanying you? David said to Ahimelech the Cohen, The king ordered me on a mission and told me, No man may know anything about the matter for which I have sent you and commanded you. Thus I informed my attendants to be at a certain secret place. And now, what do you have available? Five loaves of bread? Give them, or whatever there is, into my hand. The Kohen answered David, saying, I have no ordinary bread available. There's only sacred bread, provided that your attendants have kept themselves from women. David answered the Kohen and said to him, Women have been withheld from us yesterday and the day before. Moreover, when I left, the garments of the attendants were pure, even though this is a mundane mission. Surely today it will remain sacred in a proper vessel. So the Kohen gave him sacred food, for there was no other bread there except for the showbread that was being removed from before Hashem, in order to place hot bread on the day it is taken off. Now, there was on that day one of Saul's servants who lingered before Hashem. His name was Doeg the Edomite. He was the chief of Saul's shepherds. David then said to Ahimelech, Perhaps you have here under your hand a spear or a sword, for I did not take my sword and my weapons with me, since the king's mission was urgent. The Kohen said, The sword of Goliath, whom you slew in the Terebinth Valley, is wrapped up in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want to take it, take it, for there is none other here except for it. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. David arose and fled from Saul on that day, and he came to Ashish, king of Gath. The servants of Ashish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Is it not of him that they sing with the timbrels, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands? David took this matter to heart and was greatly afraid of Ashish, king of Gath. So he changed his demeanor in their eyes and feigned madness while in their presence. He scribbled on the doors of the gateway and let his saliva drip into his beard. Ashi said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why did you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to carry on madly before me? Should this person enter my house? 1 Samuel 22 David went from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. His brothers and all his father's house heard about this and went down to him there. They gathered to him, every man in distress, every man with a creditor, every man embittered of spirit, and he became their leader. With him were about 400 men. David went from there to Mizpeh of Moab. He said to the king of Moab, Let my father and mother come out here and be with you until I know what God will do with me. So he escorted them to the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the days that David was in their fortress. Gad the prophet said to David, Do not stay in the fortress. Go and get yourself to the land of Judah. So David went and arrived at the forest of Hareth. Saul heard that David and the men with him had been discovered. Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand, with all his servants standing about him. Saul said to his servants who were standing about him, Listen now, fellow Benjamites, is the son of Jesse going to give you all fields and vineyards? Is he going to make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds that you have all organized against me and no one revealed to me that my son covenanted with the son of Jesse and that none among you is distressed for me or reveals to me that my son has incited my servant to rise up and ambush me? As clearly as this day. Then Doag the Edomite, who was appointed over Saul's servant, spoke up and said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Nob, to Ahimelech, son of Ahitub. He inquired of Hashem for him and gave him provisions. And he gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So the king sent for Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, the Kohen, and all his father's house, the Kohanim of Nob. And they all came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And he said, Here I am, my lord. Saul said to him, Why did you organize against me, you and the son of Jesse, by giving him food and a sword 
and inquiring of God for him so that he could arise and ambush me as clearly as this day. Ahimelech answered the king and said, Who among all your servants is as trustworthy as David? He is the king's son-in-law, obeys your bidding, and is honored in your household. Did I begin today to inquire for him of God? It would be sacrilegious for me to betray the king. Let the king not accuse his servant or my father's entire household of anything. For your servant did not know anything small or great about all of this. But the king said, You must die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. The king then said to the footmen who stood about him, Surround and kill the Kohanim of Hashem, because their hand is also with David, and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not inform me. But the servants of the king were not willing to send forth their hand to slay the Kohanim of Hashem. So the king said to Doeg, You circle around and slay the Kohanim. Doeg the Edomite circled around and killed the Kohanim. On that day, he killed 85 men, wearers of linen robes. And Nob, the city of Kohanim, he killed by the blade of the sword, man and woman alike, child and suckling alike, ox, donkey, and sheep. One son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, his name was Abiathar, escaped, and he fled to David. Abiathar told David that Saul had massacred the Kohanim of Hashem. David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day that Doeg the Edomite was there and that he would certainly inform Saul. I am responsible for every life of your father's house. Stay with me and fear not, for the man who seeks my life seeks your life as well. You are safe with me. Welcome back. Thank you for watching. So Moses commands these guys that they must have 12 pieces of bread. In fact, there is a special golden table with like shelves specifically for 12 loaves of bread. The reason that it has to be 12 is because there are 12 tribes of Israel. It's this whole thing. These holy loaves of bread are holy. It's not for regular consumption. Everybody knows this. So does David not know about these rules and sort of kind of goes at it kind of innocently? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was sacred. Or does David actually not have the slightest idea? Now, we know that God is interested in this guy. And we know that David is very seriously following along to what he understands Hashem to be. So how is it that he doesn't know these rules? And does it matter? So the priest asks David, David, Man, this bread is special showbread. You know that. But wait, have you and your men abstained from women? Because then you can have the showbread. I mean, come on. It's not the worst thing in the world to give you something to eat. So I'm wondering if this is one of those times where a guy sort of justifies to himself, this is good. This isn't bad. And so they break these rules. So Ahimelech buys David's ruse, which is totally a ruse. There are no men. There is no mission. There's nothing urgent other than David's escape for his own life. Let him eat the bread. It makes sense. So David ends up being a proper renegade. He's hiding out in a cave. The people who are surrounding him are criminals. They're embittered men and his brothers. Back in the palace, King Saul is just disintegrating. And he's screaming at the, his court, his royal court of people and advisors or whomever. And he's like, you guys suck. And these are the things that you know and you're horrible and blah, blah, blah. Well, this Edomite, who, if you ask, what is the Edomite? You got to go back to Genesis. You got to go back to like literally Genesis, like the beginning. There's this guy, Jacob, and then Jacob's got a brother. His name is Esau. And the story of Jacob and Esau is really a story of Jacob sort of manipulating Esau throughout the whole time of his life. So, you know, it's not without justification that Esau isn't particularly happy with Jacob. Well, that's passed down into the generations as it was predicted, and it's just disaster. It's one of those guys that's giving Saul advice. 
But this guy Doeg talks about the priest being, you know, on David's side and he knew what was going on. So he gave him some food and he prayed for him. And yes, all of these things are totally accurate, but it was a total misrepresentation of the truth. David has generated a reputation that absolutely precedes him. The priest of Nob explains this reality to Saul when he later accuses him. He's like, well, hold on a second. For years, this guy has been the real deal. Why would I stop praying for this guy now? The result, the entire town is completely eliminated. 100%, even the cows, they're walking around. Hey man, did you kill everybody? Yeah, but what are those chickens doing? Go kill the chickens. Okay, now this is terrible. This is crazy. This is insanity. However, however, if the priest had done the thing that Moses had said, which was... Don't give this bread to anybody but the priests. Would the Edomite have had something to condemn David by? That would be enough for Saul to say, wait, you know what? Yes, everybody needs to die. That's the correct punishment for what has happened. I'm thinking probably not. Or at least it would have needed to be a very serious, a hard sell from the Edomite for Saul to say, you're right, Doeg, dadgummit. Yes, Let's go and kill all the priests and their children and the concubines and the wives and the next door neighbors and the... But David promises Abiathar security and he's like, man, this is entirely my fault. I was there. I knew what was going on. I saw Doeg. I know he's a dirtbag. I knew it was going to happen and I didn't do anything, man. I'm sorry. This is my fault. He's like, stay with me. I'll protect you. So David is far removed from luxury. He is in a cave. He's surrounded by people who are criminals. He's not surrounded by like people at the high end. He's surrounded by people who have who are angry and they're like, no nah, man, this is terrible and they're gonna be renegades. This is a change of pace. He has to be thinking to himself at least a little bit of doubt surrounding this prophecy that was spoken to him by Samuel. Pour the oil. You're the next king of Israel, David. Yay. And this is what that path is going to look like. But what's unique is how fascinating it is to sort of compare Saul's acquisition of the throne given to him. Here's a throne. Boom. And his behavior today, uh, which is, uh, you know, hey, I don't know. We're looking at David, who also he's going to get the throne. But the path to it is kind of crazy. It seems to me reasonable that David must be having some doubt because this doesn't seem to be normal. Hey, I'm going to be the next king. You better go and live in a cave and run, run from the authorities. Does it normally go that way? In either case, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. The NQE is out.